Hello, good evening. Good evening. Welcome to JL Joseph Live. It is Wednesday, the fifth day of August. And I'm so happy to be joining you here for another episode of JL Joseph Live. For those of you, if it's your very first time stopping off here on be it on my channel, be it on social media, through on Facebook, be it on Digicel, make sure you share the live right about now. So go ahead and share the live. I want to say special good evening to the folks who are joining us via radio on Vibes Radio in Dominica. So good day to you, good night to you, good evening to you. Uh, those of you who are on different parts of the world in different time zones, I want to say special good evening to you and welcome to a special edition, JL Joseph Live. Uh, this was called Acceptance, Imagining It's You. And it is pretty much going to be a discussion that will last about four weeks. And we'll focus on the way the Caribbean has responded, especially as it relates to disabilities during COVID-19. This evening, we're joined by three professionals, three educators will be joining us this evening. And um, they, they are from different islands and we'll be speaking with them and finding out, you know, what, how they dealt with COVID-19 or how it affected them in their uh, respective practices. And we're gonna be, you know, discussing way forward for the persons living with disabilities. Now, for those of you who are probably, you know, brand new to this channel, brand, brand, brand new, first time stopping through, I wanna tell you, share the live. Hit that share button, share the live, let someone know, tag a friend. Also, feel free to let us know where you're connecting from, so in what part of the world you are. If you comment underneath the link, let us know if you're logged in, in, in whatever country you're logged in from. And we would like to know, you know, where our folks are tuned in from. So I will start off the show with just giving you a little brief. Oh, hi, Martina. How are you? Thank you very much. From New York City is joined, locked in right about now. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is JL Joseph. If it's your first time, I'm JL Joseph. And um, we... We have an interesting discussion planned here for you this evening. Um, I'm just recovering from something somewhat of a throat issue, but you know, we're gonna keep it rolling. You know, things things like that happen and we just have to stay ahead and do what we gotta do. So now and again, you'll see me sipping on my ginger tea. My heart is extra, extremely hot. My hot ginger tea and honey uh, to make sure I stay 100 throughout this discussion, which will last an hour. Now an estimated 46% uh, of older people aged 60 years and over are actually people living with disabilities. One in every five women is likely to experience disability in her life, while one in every 10 children is a child with disability. The world, way it relates to the world population, one billion people in the world are persons living with disabilities. The United Nations in May of this year uh, released uh, a policy, it's, it's actually a policy brief um, as it relates to disabilities and it, the topic or the headline of it said inclusion response to COVID-19. Now, I don't know if those of you, uh, some of you follow me regularly so you probably recall back in march when covid 19 kind of shut down the entire world we had um on, on my other show capital t we had people come on to discuss some of the issues that they were facing and they were persons with disabilities or advocates for, for persons with disabilities and it was interesting to see that the world really did not consider them during a time where everybody was forced to remain at home. Persons with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by the COVID outbreak. Why did the UN decide to put together guidelines? 
Well, I did tell you one in a billion people are persons with disabilities. But guess what? 80% of those people live in developing countries. Of course, you know what the developing countries are, is the Caribbean. That's exactly where a lot of the developing countries are. Persons with disabilities are at risk of contracting COVID-19, at risk of developing even more severe health conditions and dying from COVID-19, and are at even greater risk of discrimination in accessing healthcare and life-saving procedures during COVID outbreak. Now, I know most of the islands have gotten rid of the COVID, so to speak, issue, um, but people are we're opening back up our islands now. And some folks are saying there might be a second wave or there will be a second wave. Are we ready? Are we truly ready? Well, this evening, we're going to be joined by three educators. We're going to be joined by Beverly LeBlanc, who is the executive director of the Achievement Learning Center and a lecturer at the Faculty of Education at the Dominica State College. In Dominica, she actually is one of the persons who've been in front of this entire discussion and has spearheaded this initiative. She's a trained teacher with specialized training in early childhood and special education and training in, in, as well as development. She's an advocate for people with disabilities and firmly believes that people with disabilities have the potential to succeed given the right opportunities and of course the right environment. We're also gonna be joined by Noemi White, who is Hungarian and Swiss. She grew up in France, Austria, South Korea, Switzerland, but now she lives in Barbados. She has a bachelor and master's degree in psychology. She's worked as a counselor with women and children affected by domestic violence. In 2009, she started working with the Sunshine Early Stimulation Center, and that is primarily a center that caters to children with neurodevelopmental challenges from ages one to 11. She also operates as a counselor working with many different support groups, educational workshops she, she, she facilitates. She also does individual and family counseling and home visits. And she is the president of the Barbados Society of Psychology. And we're also going to be joined by Kion Xiong, who is a trained teacher with a bachelor's in psychology and a master's degree in special education with teaching experience in both public and the private sector. He's worked with, um, he's an employee actually currently with the Ministry of Education, and he's had extensive training providing support to teachers, parents, in terms of training and intervention. And more recently, he's been the coordinator of the Regional Special Education League, that's the Disability Diagnostic and Treatment Center. So, I'm gonna welcome them on to JL Goes It Live. So without no further ado, say good day to my guest. Hello. Hello. Good night, Hi. everyone. Hi, everyone. How are you guys doing tonight? Good, good, thank you. And you? Very good. Thank you. It's an yeah. absolute pleasure to be here. It's, it's, it's lovely to have you guys join us here. I think this is a very important discussion that needs to be had. We know we cannot um, stress the importance of it. You know, before we even got on, you know, Kion was, was bringing awareness of, you know, all the different things that are going on around the Caribbean, especially where he is and, and how folks are being impacted, especially people with disabilities or living with disabilities and how much they've been impacted um, during COVID-19. Um, I, I wanna, I wanna, hi, hi Beverly, you, you, you staying quiet this evening? <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> I wanna say good evening to my you. son and my uncle. I saw that logged in from Kelowna, BC and New Jersey. Good evening. <laughs> yes, uh, a lot of folks are, are coming on and we wanna encourage them to share the live. All you have to do is click the share button. It doesn't take much energy. You don't lose an ounce of blood. 
nothing, <laughs> right? It doesn't cost you a dime and you get to, to invite other people in on the discussion. And, and this is an informative show. We hope that we can educate, inform, and now and again, laugh a little bit, so probably entertain, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> um, now, I just want to, first of all, start, um, I'll probably start with Eon and then work my way down. So Eon, well, I'll address you first for pretty much everything. Uh, but I would like you to share with the viewers and the listeners what your role entails as it relates to dealing daily with persons living with disabilities as well as special education. Thank you again for having me. Um, my role is I'm the coordinator of the Regional Special Education Needs Center. And at the center, it, what it's, the services provided is basically a multidisciplinary approach to dealing with persons with disabilities. So you, ch children, youth, and adolescents, um, we also do early stimulation. So if parents um, at the health centers are, in, are educated, so if you find out that your child is having challenges during a particular milestone, you reach out and see this is what is happening. We provide a tracking for them there. Um, for the children in the school system, those who are struggling, um, we provide interventions before we bring them in for assessment. Um, then we have therapy sessions going on for those who need a physical, speech, occupational therapy session. They come back in for those sessions. Here. Educational assessments are done for individuals too in that regard. So that's basically a snapshot of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Uh, Beverly, um, give us a little briefing on, on your role. Okay, um, good evening again, and thank you for having me again, JL. My role is of that of being the um, Executive Director of the Achievement Learning Center. Um, fortunately and unfortunately for us, because out of the challenges, we had an opportunity. We do not really have a physical space at the moment, however, we still continue to provide um, advocacy and training for children with disabilities. We have at moment 22 students at our school enrolled and we are looking forward to really using the online platform to reach out to the students who got E's and D's in the national assessment because this is a sign that they too have some form of challenge with their education, meeting the educational needs. So this is basically us in a nutshell. Hi, yeah, um, so my role at the Sunshine Early Stimulation Center is family services counselor. So I do provide consultation for parents from the community or families from the community as they may have received a referral to us or as they may have concerns on their own, they can self-refer. And I'm also in charge of the intake interviews and developing with the parents and with the teachers uh, on a school-based level a early developmental program which is very individualized to each child so our children we have for the new coming year fingers crossed we don't know yet how it's going to look but we have 70 children enrolled at our school to just give an idea of the size and yes i do parent and family accompaniment as in we do um counseling sessions or parent groups parent workshops but also i provide play therapeutic intervention with the children at the school and with the parents if they are available thank you very much guys for um letting us know i feel like we have like a nice balance going on yes um <laughs> so, nice balance uh, in terms of our guests this evening. I kind of want to start off by um, really getting a little bit personal with you guys. And when I say personal, I, I really want you to express with us what were some of your fears personally and professionally when you learned that the world was shutting down? Everybody had to go in, everybody had to stay away, uh, not necessarily just physical distancing, but self isolation as a result of COVID-19. Yeah. Um, the personal here, I think, basically is one that still lingers, and that is um, trying to stay as safe as I can. Uh, my immediate family members and close friends, are they staying safe, and how best we can survive this entire situation? Professionally, I think it would be, um, it's a, again, it's a fear that continues. 
how are we going, how, how are the parents coping, how are the children coping, and, and what impact it has on the family as it, and as a structure as it has a, as a structure basically. Because we cannot ignore the fact that this is going to have a ripple effect for the entire family, the person with a disability and the family members that are with this. It's not like they can go out and you know, they have to all be in there as much as possible, but mm -hmm. how it is that they will be. So that's one of my fears, how they are coping with it. Um, <laughs> personally, I mean, when when we heard about the COVID, and then um, because we were already experienced some challenges, so COVID was actually someone told me don't say it's a good thing, but it almost came like a blessing in disguise for us. And then um, because it really because all all the school was shut down during the same time that we ourselves were thinking of taking an early summer. It kind of made the transition so much easier for our children because we have children with autism and, the, and they were they are so they are so accustomed to their routine that when they would have if on if Monday came for example we you know a particular child if on Monday when she gets up on Monday she had to go stay home and the brother had to go to school it would affect her so because our last day we had already established that we were taking the, the Friday was our last day, we celebrated our Down syndrome day with our bakes and our bushy and had our fun and our, our colored socks. And then we went, we, we sent the message home and tell the parents because of the challenges that we were facing, we will take an early summer. And then by the end of the weekend, we had our first case and then school was shut down. So it was really a good transition for us. So everybody was home. So it didn't, it seems like they really did not miss anything. However, my greatest um, concern was how were they coping? How were the parents coping? Because we didn't have, there was no time to at least warn the parents. It came without warning. And we were familiar with the parents themselves had to go to work. Some of them had to stay home, how they were going to cope. When we start to think of learning, how we were going to reach out to them to make sure that they really got the information that they wanted. What about those who did not have the internet access? So in a case like we were really concerned, I was really worried about would they stay safe, you know, and then we would always be would reach out on our WhatsApp to find out what everybody was doing. So our greatest concern was how are the parents coping, particularly those who had to go to work? How did they get a place to leave their children? So these were some of the concerns we had at for during COVID. You see, I, I, the thing about you, you know, you talk about everybody else about, except yourself. Well, oh, what what is, with me, let me tell you, with me. I'm, with me, one of the things I told myself, I am not going to come out of COVID the same way that I went in. So I set certain goals. There's certain things that I wanted to work on. I started did my what, my what, what, plan. Was that your initial like response when you heard everything's shutting down? How yeah. did you feel? Like that's like, how I felt. I I personally did all of what you're talking about, but initially, mm -hmm. when I heard that that was going to be it, like my last day to see civilization, so to speak, until further notice, <laughs> I was panicking. I was. I didn't. Up, I didn't panic. Honestly, I didn't panic. I really didn't. I mean, at the time for us, we had to, because we had so much going on and we had to be moving, um, or moving from our um, our existing location and not sure where we were going to put our stuff. These were some of our concerns. But personally, I didn't panic because I saw it as a pause and it was a welcome pause because I was kind of going fast paced. So to me, I saw it as a way for me to just regroup, reset, reconstruct recalibrate so i really didn't panic i just kind of got myself just in line with covid and what covid was doing how about you know i think i went through um the whole range of possible experiences and emotions but i remember my very first experience was one of this is surreal is this really happening am i in a movie like all of a sudden you have all of this information coming in from all the countries worldwide and everything is just happening simultaneously with these numbers climbing. And I really felt like this is, this is not like somebody pinch me, you know? Um, but then my next step tends to be get, 
go into solution-oriented solution mode. I tend to be a very optimistic person, trying to look for the silver lining, trying to look for the solutions. So I went very quickly into that drive. Obviously, I had to also really discuss with the family personally in terms of considerations of living with a person who is in a more vulnerable age group. Uh, but generally, it really was about focusing on reaching out, uh, you know, providing, developing webcasts, developing leaflets, um, having all these interviews on the radio and TV, all relating to mental health uh, support and mental health care of all the different age groups in their homes, what can you do during shutdown, etc. And then, to be honest, there came a time where I, I just felt really overwhelmed after that, because it just was into this mode of going, 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 and I felt reaching a bit of burnout, because I don't think I really took enough time time to process the whole information for myself mm -hmm. and then I realized okay I obviously need to live what I preach and <laughs> you know manage some of my self-care and um, yeah and, and that's how then you know it started to become the new normal. Wow uh, how did COVID affect your individual countries? I mean it would be interesting to hear you know in terms of when I say just not just your countries but in terms of, you know, the persons with disabilities or, or or the people that you work with day to day, how were they impacted by COVID? Yeah. Kian, you know you're going first, right? Like, I am. <laughs> <laughs> how has it affected the um, the country? Um, I think we all would have shared a sentiments as it relates to how it affected different people. Um. And so the, it, it really shook the entire, I think, the entire system, the, the, the culture and everything has been shaken. Um, it has put things that persons have, did not think about before into perspective. Um, it caused persons to really, like um, Beverly spoke about, reflection, reflecting on things and how, it is, how else can we deal with it because this is perhaps the new normal and how this I can really adjust to it and adjust to it quickly because um, I think like that in Miami was talking about some people tend to panic a lot and how okay we can continue to panic a lot. Mm -hmm. I think it has really taken society. It still is shaking some people in society. I mean, because we still are grappling to deal with it um, and how it is we get over it and get each other through it. So we're still working. It's a working progress. Yeah. Um, Beverly, how did you affect Dominique? Well, I mean, in terms of Domin, I think we were more, we were really proactive in showing that we kept the numbers very, very low. And um, we know in terms of the school, social distancing for children is going to be actually you running around in the house with a, it just was going to be, it was not going to be possible. So I think the first step in shutting down schools um, was really good in ensuring that we keep the numbers down because as a teacher, you have to prepare to teach, you have to come and develop your lessons and you can't be chasing children, try to tell them you cannot, you know, social distancing. I mean, before when we study, we start, we introduce, we would tell our children love to hug. So I would tell them, okay, no hug, you food stick. So we kind of make fun out of it, you know? But um, in terms of the education sector, it affected the education sector because I think after Maria, a lot of our schools were not really did not have internet access. So in terms of not having the new normal where you have to teach online and students did not have internet access and devices. So while so you find all the different departments were really trying to figure out, okay, we need to make this work, but how do we make it work? And then so this is where in terms of the people, the population that I work with. Um, the education sector, we really had to do a lot of shifting, a lot of, I mean, work over time and um, to get things done and to ensure that during that time, particularly preparing for common entrance and people, you know, our parents, are uh, common entrance is a big thing and you have students for CXC. So the first question they were going to ask, okay, are we going to have common entrance? When is common entrance? Are we going to have CXC? Some CX is still going on. Now, common entrance is a look, it's, it's really a national exam, so that is something that only we could control, but we cannot control CX so because we have to depend on the other countries. So, in terms of the population I work with, education, even with me as a lecturer at the state college. Now, um, what I did before COVID, 
I had already had, I had a backup plan because I ha we have Auburn, which I we work with, which is a learning platform. But I had also set up my Google Classroom because Auburn can sometimes be very unpredictable. And most of the students would say, Miss, I didn't get my assignment. So I already had my Google Classroom platform, which was a backup plan. So by the time COVID came and everybody was wondering, okay, am I going to cancel class and to wait for second semester? I was already far gone into my classroom. So we had, <laughs> I was gone, I was, you know, I was already, I was far gone in my classroom. And then I'd already made the necessary changes in terms of the workload of the students, because again, I mean, you have to be sensitive to students' needs. So it was not really, we were, we kind of had that on the ball already. Um, in terms of also at the Archie Melodin Center, we already had our education or dot edu email because that already had already been set up for us. So we will actually we have three special ed schools in Dominica, but Archie Melodin Center was already on board by the time the others came because we had to set up emails for them. And you have the technician thinking of the secondary school who have to think of TX to the primary school who have to think of um, grade six national assessment. Not much emphasis was put on special ed, there's no exam there. But we were already ahead because we had our EDU. Our teachers had already attended the training last week for teaching of IT. So in terms of working with our children, we kind of were already ahead. We just needed now to work with the parents and to get them accustomed and to get them really, to get their buying into the new normal of learning online. Yeah, speaking of parents, you know, like, I know like it might have, it was such a challenge for me, even me as a parent, you know, knowing that I would have had to spend extra time on computers with my son, making sure he did his work. I mean, I totally failed, completely failed at that. Like I was a complete failure where that was, uh, that is concerned. So the fact that you guys really had all your stuff organized in, in, in Dominica, um, in terms of you specifically, you know, um, hats off to you. Um, no, I mean, no, I mean, how was, um, how was Barbados? Yeah, so let me speak about Barbados as a country on a whole first, and I'm sure later we will get to speak more specifically about the teaching experience and online and and so forth. But um, I do think that Barbados has the advantage, similarly to Dominica, that we are a small country, of course. And so our numbers are a little, it's a little bit more easy to even control ports of entry, for example. So I think Barbados has also been very proactive in um, planning for the various phases of both shutdown and opening back up slowly. It's been handled very well and I do, um, you know, I'm able to say that the Barbadian people have been compliant also with the directions. I do think that currently, luckily, there is a high level of trust in our current government when it comes to those directions and, and instructions to be followed um, by the majority at least. So that has helped. However, there has been a bit of um, concern recently since July 14th, the airport has reopened and of course now flights are coming back in. We are of course heavily dependent like all the Caribbean countries of tourism and therefore that is you know the balance between saving the economy versus saving people's health and lives um, has to be you know it's just very sensitive. Um, so so far we have had our numbers from you know, having numbers to down to zero to back up um, at, I think, 20, 26 at the moment. Um, so we're, we're keeping a close eye on it, but so far it's being managed. Um, you know, for sure, I think in terms of the economic effect that I'm sure I'm not speaking just for Barbados, but for all the countries, that certainly has been the biggest shock to so many households and families. And no matter what, income group or socioeconomic background it really has rattled people's homes and levels of income to me on a professional level it has been a very hard time to witness some of that doing home visits um providing or assisting with the um distribution of food hampers seeing the need of people where they have completely lost their income and not yet having been able to access any sort of uh, funding or be it unemployment benefits and so forth, having children really fearing for the children's survival in terms of the needs, the basic needs being met, that has been very difficult and traumatic, I think, even at a community level. 
Um, however, I also want to say that there have been amazing people out there, both individuals as well as companies who really have reached out and who really have supported both monetary and in kind. So that even the community of special needs, you know, has had some additional support as much as possible while the struggle still continues. Um, yeah, and I'm sure we will talk more about the online learning experience yeah. because that has been very challenging and a lot of our households are not connected yet to Wi-Fi and are not, uh, you know, a lot of children do not have access to devices. But um, yeah, back to you, Jill, because I'm sure there will be more. <laughs> yeah. uh, at this time, I just want to, I just want to, um, don't want to forget that we have people coming on, people viewing, people viewing through many different channels. We have people on Digicel, and uh, that's on TV, and um, that's channel three. We have folks online on my Facebook page. We have people as well on Digicel's Facebook page. Uh, we also have on YouTube. Uh, but primarily, I'm taking. I'm going to be taking most of the comments from my page because I am a one man show. So <laughs> I, I tend to just um, capture the comments that are made on, on my page. So if you have any questions, I want to encourage you to come over to, to my page. Um, that's JL Joseph uh, on Facebook. And if you have any questions or concerns or anything that you want to add to the discussion, we welcome anything. If you feel that you it's best for you to reach out uh, via WhatsApp, there is a WhatsApp number that you can send up. Uh, a WhatsApp too. It's one six four seven four zero four three nine seven three. So you can send a WhatsApp if you have a question. You want to remain um, probably um, anonymous. Or you don't want people to know you, that it's you. Feel free to shoot me a line, and I will be sure to put your question or your concerns to the educators we have here this evening. So thank you very much, guys, uh, from BC and and New Jersey and all the folks who are tuned in right about now. Um, I also want to, at this time, say thanks to the sponsors of this program, sponsored by UNICEF, the Achievement Learning Center, the Government of Dominica, and of course, Digicel. And uh, without them, we could not be here speaking with you this evening. So a big thank you goes out to them. We want to continue into the conversation um, and uh, one of the concerns is that, or, or questions that we might, we might have is, why do you feel it was so important for there to be separate measures put in place for persons with disabilities? Because they were uh, people, one of the, one of the, the, the recurring, I mean, it went as far as, you know, the UN general had said, you know, they were left out of the conversation. Why was it important uh, for measures to be put in place in order to, to focus on, on that. Yeah. I think, um, thank you again for the question. I think the measures were put in place because when we talk about disability, we need to understand that there are um, different categories of disabilities. And within the category, you may have a, a, a variation of it or a continuum of effect. Like if you were to talk about persons with intellectual disability, you have those who are mildly, moderately, severely, and even profoundly affected. So in order for us to really um, meet their needs, it needs to be very, very specific, very much operationalized. So as such, it's it, it, it's more complex population to deal with, but at the same time, it's a population that desperately needs to be addressed, needs to be supported as well. Um, anybody else wants to wants to add? I don't want to really focus on any specific person. I feel this half can be a, a somewhat of a discussion. So anybody who wants to, to chime in can, can go on. Yeah, so I'll jump in. Um, I do, you know, following with from what Kion saying, uh, definitely agree that it is even to speak about persons with disabilities or the community of disabilities. It's such a huge, you know, field, and we have to consider what are we talking about. Are we talking about um, what happens, for example, if persons have to be taken to isolation centers, you know, when there is, for example, be it children or adults who have challenges communicating, have challenges expressing themselves, or may have challenges 
understanding, comprehending even what's going on, uh, even if they may be able to intellectually grasp what is happening, but they may have sensory processing challenges where they're easily overwhelmed by the bright lights or fearful of the persons in the white suits and the face shields and, uh, and the gloves and so forth, and nobody is able to be there to support them because even their most personal um, relationships have been removed due to the, um, you know, obviously the contagious factor. And so I think we have to consider all of those, even physical accessibility for those who may have challenges uh, in mobility. Um, so it is true that those items have not really been considered when it came to the emergency response. Understand mm -hmm. to some extent, but it has to really be included, um, you know, yesterday. Yes. And um, in addition, I think when we think about the learning experience, even our Ministry of Education in Barbados has fairly quickly put out various um, requirements towards the reopening of schools and they are being adapted as we go ahead and there have been considerations put in place for nursery versus primary school and secondary schools so consideration about age groups and what can children reasonably be expected to do or not do while keeping staff safe at the same time then it is so important to include children with disabilities and with learning challenges there because yet again what Beverly earlier on alluded to the whole question of physical distancing is not something that you can expect of, of children who yet again have challenges maybe with their visual, visual spatial understanding of what is close, what is far, or may have challenges understanding and following instructions that are being given, or may just be emotionally overwhelmed and all they need is to hug a friend or to hug their teacher, mm -hmm. etc. So, I mean, that is so important what you said, you know, because I have a friend who's a teacher and I mean, I, I, I live in, in Canada and she is so upset that schools are opening up um, because she says that she, she has some autistic kids in her class and she's like, how, how do I not hold them? You know, how, how do I stay away? Like, how is that possible? Like, I'm going to end up with COVID, you know, it's like. <laughs> It, it, it's, it's a very scary discussion. It's like, yes. how do you say no to, no, yes, a child, an autistic child, even just a regular child who want to be held, you know, um, first day of school, how do you go about, you know, saying goodbye to your mom that you've been forced to remain indoors with for long periods of time throughout this entire ordeal. And now you are told, this is a new stranger who you're going to have to like, trust but you can't hug them <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? um there also i think the people with disabilities had to be included because number one in the disability community we do we see the person first and the disability after so they are people just like everybody else and so therefore they had to be included in the conversation they had to be included in the communication. They had to be included in the policy. And I'm really happy that it came from really, like it was a global response and they recognized, wow, what are we doing? We have faced with this global pandemic, but we are leaving out a very important group of people. So this to me, when I saw the, when I read the policy brief, I was like, this is very, this is a good conversation to have because finally it took COVID to really remind them of the things that advocates had been saying for the longest while. And as you rightly said, how do you tell? I mean, we haven't seen our children for from since March. And they are huggers. So when we do come back, go back to school, I can't tell Nadesh don't hug me. Because even if I say Nadesh, Nadesh, we're not hugging today, I'll give you a footsie. She'll get somebody else to hug because that's just how they, they are naturally huggers. So, and then you talk about right now, they have also have to get used to us again because, you know, they have been away from us for such a long time. So it is important that they have to be part of the conversation. So they, we, can, they, we, can, well, we can actually share, finally share, and we can do it together as a community because everybody's saying the same thing. We can all speak one language and say, yes, this was not just Barbados was just saying or Dominica or Guyana. This is what we all realize, and this is why it is important now more than ever before. COVID has given us an opportunity. We are not sure if we'll get that opportunity again to have that kind of conversation when it, when it 
pertain to people with disabilities. If we do not do something right now and change our focus and write make sure we have the proper framework and policies we may not, and we'll just keep talking and having meetings but we need to have change so covid providing an opportunity for change not just change in our mouth but change really put some action put some plan of action in place and realize okay that's it we just can't sit by anymore and just talk and smile about it because the thing about disabilities it has no respect of person yeah, thank you very much uh, for that, for that Beverly. Um, it, it's, it's, it's so interesting, all the, all the things that you guys are saying. Uh, but, you know, once COVID happened, everybody was set to, now everybody's going to go online. I mean, I'm, I'm also in school, and my school made, like, literally within 24 hours, we were online. So that we never skipped a beat. We didn't miss a class. Nothing happened like except that we were now all online right but but for developing countries you know it took a little bit longer there were, there were a few more challenges and even more so you know persons living with disabilities would have had even more challenges because of not being exposed to even the software because I, i've actually witnessed you know families who have children who are disabled or have some sort of disability, they'll tell them, you know, don't touch this, you'll break it. You know, don't touch the tablet, leave it, you'll break it. You know, because it's expensive. Don't touch the computer, you'll break it. And now you have to tell them, go on to the computer now to you. That's how you're gonna that's how you're gonna have to interact now. You know, it's the computer. What were some of the challenges that you guys faced in terms of this new distance learning setup in your respective countries? Whoever wants to go. Oh, yeah. I first, and um, I refer to it as baptism by fire. <laughs> That's how I refer to it. I refer to it as baptism by fire. And we were all in the same boat. It was nothing like achievement in center in the corner, and then everybody else. We, we all had to do, we all were just thrust into it, baptism by fire. And then we now had to. So the teachers had to figure out, okay, what do we do? Some teacher was like, Miss, I'm not too familiar with Google Classroom, or I'll just use my WhatsApp because I'm, I want to see my students face to face. And the parents would say, I do not know how to log in. So, I mean, it was really interesting, but we just realized we were all in this thing together. And then, so we had to pull our way. We had to work nice. I mean, the, the program coordinator at the school, the principal, She's more tech savvy than I am. So when I would see the parents send a message, I would say, call Miss Pele, and then she would be up working. I really want to say, congrats. I really want to thank Miss Pelahane and uh, Miss Janelle, um, the IT um, people at Ministry of Education. They really helped us to set up our classroom. Because when we set up our classroom the first time, we didn't set up properly because you had to set up for each subject. And then, so we had to go. But the thing about it is that they really came on board with us and they supported us throughout. So by the time the other schools came in, we were already ahead, as I said. But then, and then we learned from the others. Even the even some of the information that I got that that would be shared with me, I would share it with the other teachers because within our class, our our mainstream schools, we still have exceptional learners. You know, we still. Have Learner. So definitely that support. So sometimes if I come across a video, if I come across a, a map, an article, I would share it with them so they could, could, could get some strategies that they could work with their teachers. I mean, so it was really baptism by fire. Some parents, eventually they came on board. You know, we had to have a one-on-one. -on -one. We had a lot of small group meetings, you know, some of them when you said the assignment. But we were, with, we, were, we were up for the challenge. We got we would we would I would meet with the teachers every week just to have a re, uh, just a a debriefing. How did it go? How what is going well? And um and for us now it was like I we I didn't I didn't really give my teachers the kind of support that I really would have wanted to give them because at, while they were teaching and trying to figure out the Google Classroom, we ourselves three three of us were trying to figure out how do we get our stuff out of the school by the thirty first of May? So we had so much juggling, you know. Moving from a from a, a location, not sure where we're going to go, 
and at the same time trying to provide the support to the teachers that you don't feel too overwhelmed. But then we, we didn't get drunk. We can go through the fire. We didn't get burned. We went through the water. We didn't get drunk. So we are here and we are happy that we made it. Yeah. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> Kiana, go after you. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I don't think we were as, as, as lucky as um, Beverly there because um, it goes back again to the categories of disability. And while some categories can um, access and be part of the online thing, the Google Classroom, the Zoom, and the Mac, there's some, there's a fraction of it that really can't. And that is where the teachers then and still now, and I think it's across the region, continue to struggle. How do we meet these? Um, in, in Guyana, what we've been trying to do, what the teachers have been doing, and they're, they're totally commended for that, is that they've braved the shutdown, shut in, and they went into schools and they tried to go back to the folders for each child and put together worksheets for them. And then they would send that with them. And then the parents and the teachers would connect via WhatsApp or whatever medium, because again, we have to face the reality that some, not all parents have devices, not all parents have internet connectivity. And so we have to drudge through that to see how it is we're best going to be able to help the children to understand the concept. In some cases, we had teachers um, recording what the children are doing, sending it back to the, um, the teachers. And we have cases whereby for those particularly on the spectrum, some of them, this interaction here just isn't working for them. They do not want to see themselves on a screen. So how else do we engage these learners? Because they need to learn at the same time. We're saying that well, they need to be engaged in the discussion and be part of the process, but how else do we get them to do it? Um, there are those who are just intellectually challenged, but really um, severely challenged. So the whole concept of, and like you guys spoke about the one time I can touch the device and then I can't touch the device and I can't do all these mixed signals and all these yeah. things that we couldn't do that we now have to do and how it is we work through. So, it, it, it's really something that the teachers are really trying to continue to try. Um, I, I think understanding the concept of learning loss is what they're struggling with. And while we're looking at learning loss, we're also acknowledging the fact that the gap is widening or has yeah. widened and perhaps will widen even more as it relates to persons with disabilities. Um, for my workplace at the center whereby we just started this early stimulation program, we brought in the children, we brought in the parents and we're teaching them empowering the parents and showing them what it is and then all of a sudden you have this break so what happens do you know so we're trying to do these therapy sessions <laughs> virtually <laughs> <laughs> it has its challenges but i must commend the parents who are really trying to make it work so there again you have another thing that you're working with um i think beverly would have alluded to this that covid also came it, it can be seen to like a blessing in that it's really shown us the shortcomings, the areas that really need to be worked on. We, we have not done what we should have done because somewhere there's a paper that says we need to do this, huh? but let's get back on track because yes. we <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Great. Um, yeah, the, I mean, I can only agree with all the points that have been made. Indeed, I think at our school, well, first of all, I, I just wanted to add to the previous point that actually what's a really great development at the moment is that the principal of our school um, at the Sunshine Early Stimulation Centre has sent a proposal to the Ministry of Education and really, um, you know, putting forward the considerations about including children and different learners into their opening back to schools protocols and uh, we have reached out to other special needs schools in Barbados who all the principals are very interested in getting being involved also in that discussion so a meeting is um, coming up with the Ministry of Education forward in that direction so I'm just very happy that this is while there are small steps they yes. still are steps forward um, so thank you. But, you know, back to the current question, indeed, for us, um, the majority of our children, first of all, we have children from as young as one, one and a half, two years old. Uh, so that developmentally, even that preschool age group until the age of like four or five, even typically developing children are not necessarily capable or shouldn't be asked to just sit down, be quiet, focus on a tablet or on a screen and try and do that sort of um, more abstract type of learning and listening and, and, and responding. So there is a lot more hands on learning that is needed. 
And how do we do that? Yes, you alluded to it, Kion, is a lot on the parents, really and truly. And that has been both a blessing and a huge challenge at the same time. We also do have, so at our school, even though we have a primary school section as well, up to the age of 11, we don't work towards the common entrance exam because our children, you know, we work with their different intelligences that are not necessarily primarily academic, but definitely are a lot of hands-on learning. And so what our teachers have done, and I really want to commend them here, all of them, they've done an amazing job. Similarly to what you said, Kion, is putting together packages, and I was assisting in delivering those at home, including Play-Doh, including crayons, uh, including different manipulatives, whatever it was suitable for them. And we also had um, activity sheets that were sent home via either WhatsApp or email for those parents who weren't able to connect live on any of the platforms with their children. And so they tried to do those activities individually then, and if possible, they were taking videos, sent them back to the teachers who weren't able to give them further recommendations. So it really took a very individualized approach. And I, again, that's why I really want to commend them because the teachers work very hard in trying to make it suitable for all of our different learners. And, you know, it has been a, a baptism through fire, as you say, Beverly, it was a learning Someone said, well, we're, we're flying this plane already and we're still building it. And that's <laughs> yeah. <help."> like that. <laughs> so at this point, if we have any parents listening in today, um, you know, I did witness so many parents feeling challenged, feeling stressed out, feeling overwhelmed, not even just with their different learners, but with typically developing children. Because yeah. sometimes it's a matter where you have three children, they all go through to three different classes and you have you're supposed to have three devices for them to have their classroom <laughs> at the same time that's not happening so you know to manage all of that all of a sudden parents had to become not just parents but also teachers and also therapists yeah. and it was overwhelming and still is for many of them and I, just at this point i want to say to you parents you're doing an amazing job you cannot be a teacher you cannot be a therapist you are a parent first and just have a great time with your children find time to de-stress you're doing an excellent job. Be proud of yourself. So having said that, I think it's important to think. <laughs> yes, I do think um, I want to just briefly a two words about considerations about sensory differences. Obviously, I don't have the time to go into that in details, but we need to understand that a lot of children with neurodevelopmental challenges, be it autism, be it um, Down syndrome, be it other um, more rarer syndromes, be it some learning difficulties, be it ADHD, um, a lot, cerebral palsy, whichever, a lot of it also is influencing how the children see the world, hear the world, feel the world, smell the world, taste the world. And when we want children to sit down to an online classroom, we have to consider about what are they sitting on. Yeah. Some of them do better if they have a bouncy ball or if they're allowed to get up every five minutes for a little brain break. Some of them do well if they have something they can fidget with in their hands. Some of them do well if there is classical music playing in the background. Or for others, that's the worst thing to do is having some other music going on in the background. So let's think about how the children learn and how they perceive the world. For some of them, it's a matter of dimming the brightness of the screen that will help them remain more focused because it might just be too bright or there might be too many other things going on on the screen and you can kind of cover some of it with a cloth and so forth. So go online, you know, do your research about the different sensory ways of learning and supporting those children. And, um, you know, again, small steps forward, but forward we go. Yes, yes, definitely small steps forward, but forward we go. I like that one about the, the airplane, find the plane. I still love well, it. I like that. Welcome up with all of these good friends. <laughs> yeah, that's, really, that's super cool. Um, as a as a teacher, or in most of you are teachers, what was the response and the support that you got? Have you gotten any support, or you've just been working through it like you guys have been rightly saying? Well, we just are we just going through it. And um, before, I just wanted to also um, support Naomi talking about the parents. Because, um, I mean, we did a, we did our own parent survey. We sent out a survey to our parents because it was the first time for us. We wanted to know what is it that we were doing, what did you do, what went, and what is it that we need to um, work on. And I heard you all both suggested something which we have already said we are going to do. And the package is to bring for the families who may not have access to internet. But in some of them, they were like, 
some of them had issues and some of the issues were like me getting them to focus, getting them to, to pay attention, getting them to focus for a long time because they wanted them to do it. And um, also some of them, they prefer the face to face. They just want, the parents said, I just want school to open. I just want my child to go back to school. And then um, I know what, but what really worked for us is the fact that when we had Google meetings, because we would have parent meetings and teachers meetings, and then when we said some of the parents actually, when we started to bring up some of the ideas, they were like, I, I prefer Google Meet over just a Google Classroom because then the, the child can actually see you, they can hear your voice, so they know you are still there. So some of the parents were also able to sort of bring up some suggestions as to how we could make it, make the lessons more interactive for the children. And um, they really supported, they really, some of the, those who really um, felt they, that they were up to it, that it was not so much of a challenge to them. And we respected that. We didn't force them. They were like, Miss, I don't think I can handle it. I'm like, okay, if you feel you cannot handle it, we're not going to force you because, I mean, if you're already not feeling comfortable with the technology and you know you have to have a child who has who has no speech, who has a challenge with all sensory issues, they're not used to that. They're used to coming to school and sitting and teacher reading to them and lying on the rug and they know, okay, Tuesday is sports day and I have to stay home and doing all these things. And, you, and there's, there's a particular child, her mom said, no matter what we send home, she won't do it at home because she's already figured this is, at school is teacher's job, home is mommy's job. So we don't send anything from anything for school, we don't say that because she, she will not do it because she figured out that's not for home. When I'm home, it's a totally different thing. And we, we, are, we are not going to fight this. So we really want to thank the parents who really, you know, um, woke up to the challenge. And then um, we are also now, based on the survey, the report they sent for us, we are now going to go back to the drawing board and then get some new strategies, get some new ideas together that we can, you know, work with our students. And we know Tuesdays play this, so probably we can have our gym on, on, on YouTube on Tuesday and all the teachers will be doing our little aerobics and they will be seeing us, you know, just one interaction. But um, the thing about it is we have to do what we have to do. Speaking of way, way forward, um, if there were to be a second way, hmm. how prepared do you guys feel you are or to, to face any challenges now that will come as a result of a second week? Leon, I see you. you, you too. <laughs> <laughs> we all pause. Um, well, we're just hoping and praying for the reopening of the schools for many reasons that were mentioned. But I do believe that, you know, a second wave and having to extend the time at home, it is going to bring extended challenges, yes. But with some of the things now, we have started to learn our lessons. We have started to figure out certain things that work and that don't work. So I believe we can just continue to build that plane. <laughs> Yeah, we could to bleed that plate. Yes, I, I, I think we've learned a lot. I mean, yes, there's still more to be learned. But I think based on what we have, we've got a good footing as to where we can go and how we can go forward and charge in the place. But yes, we need to open the schools, particularly for those who really need that interaction and getting the concepts. And I'm, I think I'm, interested, I'm, I'm super interested to see how, how they hold kids. I just want to go and stand there and just put a camera. <laughs> and um, again, I'm going to go back to say, when we are faced with challenges, we look for opportunities. And um, I, one of the things that whenever we go to PTAs, those are teachers, teachers, when we have PTAs and parents, there's always one thing we always hear. Parents, be involved in your child's education. So now, Naomi, we get an opportunity to build a big play. And nobody yes. is going to be out of that plane. The parents Absolutely. are going to be there as co-pilots. The yes. teachers are going to be pilots. And we're going to have our students as passengers. And we are going to have a safe landing. It's so that's what COVID has prepared. Because, I mean, on the normal times, you would send an activity home. And then sometimes the parents would never open the bag. Mm -hmm. And the home comes back. But now you have to do it. And then we are providing that support. And part of this project, one aspect of this project is actually doing some parent training. And then yes, we're going to have to do it um, virtually. But not only Dominican parents are going to benefit, but all our parents, because we get to hear, I mean, all the parents probably may not have identical, but there were some similarities in their challenges. And then so it's going to be a time to learn and best practices. So we're going to have a very good plane 
for our children a special education needs playing with our parents <laughs> as co pilot and the teachers as pilot. I like it. Yeah, th thank you very much for that, Emily. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're out of time. I just want to leave a little space for you all if you have any final comments, um, any final shout outs that you want to you give. Um, we could start with Kian because since he's been the one we. <laughs> I, I, my parting sentiments would be those that that line would have shared earlier, and that would be particularly to the parents and the teachers, in that you are you've really been doing the best you can, and you should continue to do that. Keep up the good work, and let's all continue to build and strengthen this flame that we're building here. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Yes, I just want to thank everybody who has logged on, who has shared the link, uh, who has sent their comments. Thank you to the three of you. Thank you, Jail, for having me and for Kion and Beverly um, for this lively discussion. Uh, definitely also shout out to everyone uh, in, the, in our beloved community. And, um, you know, everybody's doing the best they can. And I think we spoke about many challenges, but I have seen tremendous, you know, amazing stepping people who stepped up in in so many ways including parents including teachers uh including therapists um and strangers so you know this is the way to go is to keep looking out for your brothers and sisters Beverly? yeah um thank you again jl and keon and naomi for um accepting the invitation and again going back to the plane this is an opportunity inclusion is within every is within everyone's ability we have advocated, we have championed for breaking the stigma, building um, com inclusive communities, lighting up the possibilities. And there, even in the dark cloud of COVID, we still have a bright light of possibilities for promoting collaboration, not just within our, it's not time to be, I'm in my small corner and you and yours. It's a time for us, for we to come together not Barbados doing their own thing and Guyana, whatever you're doing in Guyana is working well with share best practices. Whatever is doing in Barbados, let's share with each other because at the end of the day, we work with the same population. Well, I think this is a very tremendous opportunity so we can share together as pro to build professional um, networking as well as to strengthen our parents to provide what is it that they need, what is it that they need to help their students so then we ourselves we can help them. So it is a very opportunity for partnership and there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's a light in the middle of that darkness, in that dark cloud of COVID. And everything is possible. Boy, one thing, Beverly, you got those, <laughs> you have it. <laughs> don't far, don't far. I wanna say thank you very much to, to all three of you for joining, for joining um, me here, you know, and, and sharing as educators, um, especially as it relates to to COVID-19 and how you guys were all individually impacted. And it seemed like y'all are doing just fine, you know? Um, it, it seemed, I mean, it, it's encouraging, you know, to, to hear the, strat, the, the, the steps uh, that you guys have made ahead, you know, in terms of ensuring that the entire community is taken care of, not just the special needs for the persons with disabilities, but everyone is taken care of. And thank you very much for what you guys are doing in your individual um, communities in countries and like beverly said you know like share best practices and, and continue continue with this next week we have another exciting show for you guys we're going to be talking to the parents so we're going to be talking to parents from different communities um so we want you to tune in next week same time same place for another edition you know acceptance imagining it's you, it's you right <laughs> thank you guys Thank, uh, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.